summary which was was happening, and then I said I try to prove something. I have a list of paper, list of paper with formulas, and uh, so our objects at this stage is just manifolds with, with Riemannian metric, and such the scalar curvature of this metric is greater than something. Typically, it is zero, but not necessarily. Many features are common for, for other numbers. Maybe here, yeah, positive or negative. And one thing to keep in mind that constraint, so we are concerned not so much with topology of that, though topology enters, but with geometry, it, uh, constraint it imposes. And it is very st different from other uh, uh, condition associated to curvature. Right, because other conditions, or the basic condition used positivity of reach or sectional curvature, they roughly restrict your shape like you see for convex sets. They like convex, and there are very few variations they may admit. And then you try to see more precisely what happens. But here, the geometric picture, the very adequate geometric model, are will be hypersurfaces which have mean curvature positive or greater than the constant. And these are, maybe have a very kind of a wild shape. And it was example I was giving, because you may have this kind of a, this one has by no means positive curvature, but rotation is symmetric thing. You can arrange it with positive mean curvature, which is certainly quite counterintuitive. So it may have, and more, in, in, in principle, very simple that in order to have positive scalar curvature, it's enough to have big positive curvature in one direction, which dominates everybody and may spread anywhere else. On one hand, and for scalar curvature, you need two directions of positive curvature, and they, again, may dominate everything else. So, as a simple kind of example, if you have a subset, kind of polyhedral subset in the Euclidean space, so if this k if its dimension is less than n minus 2, then if you take small neighborhood and the boundary of this neighborhood, it will have positive mean curvature. Like you have graph in the three space, and around it, you have positive mean curvature. And if it's n minus 3, then you have spheres around, and this has positive scalar curvature. And you can arrange it in an extreme kind of uh, wide range of possibilities. <coughs> For, that, for instance, where is the eraser on this? If you have a flat torus, and you can take my tiny little hole and attach a huge bubble, and huge, like spherical bubble, it's n dimensional torus, and it has positive scalar curvature, but here in this tiny thing you have a little bit of negative curvature, and it's unavoidable. And this is very tricky, I just you cannot see it by any kind of elementary means. Because it's, the more narrow it is, the curvature converges to, to zero. And in the limit, you have this torus and this bubble, and they become separated. So all naive stability theorem don't work. And kind of pr prototypical stability which exists is stability of the, uh, in, 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 in Schwarz with metric, encoded by, by Penrose inequality, which says that there is some particular flat scale of, it's a, a kind of, Euclidean model, of course, not, not Minkowski. There is flat, scalar flat metric, and if you at, at, attach to it kind of little bubbles with positive helicurvature, curvature, this, this section will be small. Uh, this area of the section will be small. And it is precise inequality saying what it is, it's exactly corresponds to, 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 to the size of this neck in this, in this in this met in Schwarz's metric, if you have, don't remember the number. If you write down this formula, there is unique spherically symmetric one which has scalar curvature zero, etc. Uh, uh, depending how gross infinity, the gross infinity is <coughs> has some physical significance. So it's one thing to keep in mind. On the other hand, <coughs> there are constraints, and there are specific constraints, which show that on one hand it's extremely flexible, on the other hand there are constraints and the basic kind of prototypical Result, <coughs> the simplest one, sh the first sharp result of Euter rules, following suggestion by Blade Lawson, which says that if I have a sphere, and this, by the way, has, let me formulate for three dimensional sphere, because there are, <coughs> it's already quite, 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 quite significant, <coughs> is uh, that if you have a three dimensional sphere, 
on one hand and some other Riemannian manifolds on the other hand of dimension n, say, close, I'm sorry, dimension 3, and you map it here by map f, then that was the best, uh, so, so here is scaling curvature 6, remember it's for n dimensional sphere, it's, it's curvature n, n minus 1, so it's, it's curvature 6, and then there is the following inequality, if we take differential and the ex external power of the differential and this norm, and multiply it by 6, this will be greater or equal than scalar curvature of, y, of, of x at every point x. We put 6 here, and this of x. So it means that if, it, in particular, if the map is decent decreasing, then this scalar curvature cannot be greater than 6. So the metric was once you enlarge manifold beyond some reason, you cannot enlarge the sphere, even changing the topology. But of course, what essential, I'm sorry, degree is not zero. The topology in top dimensional class, fundamental class, enters the picture. And, and this is proven with some effort because it is odd dimensional situation, but still because you write you, you, what you do, you take certain bundle here. It is a kind of positive spin bundle pulled here. Then here you take Dirac operator with this bundle, of course, and then you take odd dimensional index theorem, or you can reduce it to even dimensional index theorem, and then there are some uh, formulas, as I explained, so that's impossible. It's one, uh, but one proof. It was not before, this is not sharp constant, and don't have to make much computation, it's kind of clear from general principles. But, but there are for this, there are two other proofs. And one of them I will come later, which is give limited information, but has some advantage, because when you go to high dimensions, immediately you need this manifold to be spin. In dimension three, of course, this problem does exist, everybody spin. In high dimensions, there must be spin. <coughs> if you want to do it without spin, you have kind of different methods, but they never give this result. Except for dimension three, there is an alternative result, which is even better, which is, so here, you see it's areas, this means how much it expand uh, areas, yeah, it's, so it's, it's differential, uh, this number measures area expansion. You see it's, it has the same scaling as, uh, as, as scaling coefficient, so it's got a perfect formula. But there is still better than that in dimension three, and it says that we have only for spheres, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's theorem by Marcus and Neves, that if we have three-dimensional sphere with metric of scaling curvature greater than this six, then you can cover it kind of by two-dimensional spheres. So it kind of computes, so you can, you can slice it in a homologically faithful way by two-dimensional spheres, area of which will be less than four pi. So for the usual sphere, of course, you have the sliding, and this you can do. Despite the fact, of course, that this manifold will be not round. We have the bubbles, and we have all the strange things. However, we can go, 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 go and cover it. And this is quite, quite remarkable, a simple theorem. And there is none of that in high dimensions. It's a big question if this counterpart in big in high dimensions. <coughs> what you do have, this LaRue theorem still holds. The same inequality, instead of 6, you have scalar curvature of the sphere. So n, n minus 1. And, have. and that was the theorem, and then it was generalized, again, with the Dirac operator, and in this extremely kind of useful generalization, which was not until recently fully, fully exploited by Goethe Assemblyman, where it says the same proof, essentially, but computation is somewhat he heavier, and the result, this result still holds, because here, in fact, we have better inequality, which I don't want to write, because this better inequality doesn't generalize, and so what you need of the sphere, kind of, there are two things you need of the sphere. One is topological kind of index of certain operator must be on zero. So it is here to pull back positive spins here, to this here, and you know, th this will be early characteristic of that. Exactly, which doesn't work for odd dimensional spheres, so you need some effort to handle it. But on the other hand, you need some kind of, uh, the fact that when you pull back this bundle, this bundle will be sufficiently small here, and this curvature of this pullback bundle doesn't contribute too much to the, the, the formula expressing, you know, this basic formula for Dirac operator, which is equals positive operator plus one quarter of scalar curvature plus curvature term of this twisted bundle. So positivity of this must override this. 
And then the, the, this theorem says, and this is true even if it is positive curvature operator. You don't have to have metric of positive, uh, usual metric on the sphere, but it's positive curvature operator. Except then there are some trouble depending on topology. For spheres, everything fine, topology is right. For other species, spaces with positive curvature operator. And what's so remarkable about this, this is, has its implication. It, it gives you some elementary statement about Euclidean spaces, which you cannot prove otherwise. And it says that if I have a, now surface, here, I think even for for for, for in three dimensional case probably it's easier. <laughs> so I have hyper, you have n minus one dimensional hypersurface in Euclidean space, and its mean curvature of this hypersurface is everywhere greater than one of the sphere. And then this y, if you, you cannot map it to the non-zero degree to the sphere such that this map will be distance decreasing with respect to induced metric. Right? For dimension two, it probably maybe probably followed from Gauss Barnet or something. But in high dimension certainly doesn't, and there is no 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 elementary proof. And the fact you can induce it, and see it's very tricky because it depends, it's not really embedded hypersurface. If it's immersed, you may have everything, you see. You may have a immersed circle with any curvature you want, any long you want, and the same high dimension. In, you take kind of Torus, two torus in uh, embedded in standard way in R three, no, yes, thick and circle. It has very positive mean curvature. You take it covering, it become huge, but it's immersed. You can't make it embedded. Because, so you have to, you cannot do it by looking at the surface itself. You have to know it feels something with positive scalar curvature. And the way you prove it, you apply the theorem for very special degenerate matrix. And this degenerate matrix is like that. You will have say ball. And it's sitting in R n, and this is seeing R n plus 1. And now in this bigger space, I take an epsilon neighborhood. So I thicken it in this direction. It becomes like that. And then this mean curvature generates scalar curvature in this epsilon neighborhood. And this is positive thing, so it's still positive curvature operator. So you do it, and you get this result. But what's so certainly bizarre is that when you, when you work with the Dirac operator, the only term which matters here, but in the limit, it's unclear what happens. I don't understand what if the object in the limit is super, of course. But you see, you cannot work it kind of totally forgetting the ambient space. It's very important. It, build, it, it bounds subject of positive encouragement. And so this is one of the results. So I want to uh, emphasize, because so elementary, is that, but it's, again, it requires many folds to be spin. It's at some moment. Of course, when we in Euclidean space, everybody is spin. So it says if I have a hypersurface in the Euclidean space, y mean curvature, and I, I map it to the sphere Sn minus 1, with non zero degree, this is my map, then mean curvature of this y at a point y times norm of the differential of my map must be less or equal than mean curvature of the sphere. Or, in fact, it may be not a sphere, but anybody. It may, uh, it's true for any convex, but maybe actually any convex hypersurface <coughs> say to be sphere at the point f of y. And it's, uh, and it's true if you replace all this picture by manifold with positive scalar curvature, whatever, except you need spin, right? At some moment, you need spin. However, it's, un it's unknown, it's unclear if spin is necessary. And, and, I, and there are weaker statements of this kind of non sharpening qualities, and the proof, which you know, is actually quite uh, painful, and I'm actually in, 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 didn't check all detail in them if you don't want to be spin. So it's one. And, but you see, there's what, so, so by, 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 nice and they're sharp, and the, because they're sharp, we shall see it, it raises. Uh, the sphere is extremal for this purpose. Yeah, you can prove that equality holds only if it is actually a sphere. And uh, in dimension two, I'm not certain if it's, it's obvious or not. Yeah, dimension two, it, it, it's probably it might follow from the Gauss banana. No, it cannot because no, no, because it depends on the it depends on the. Uh, the interior, you know, certainly. You know, even dimension <coughs> two, I, I think, is 
it's not obvious. Okay, so, so it's, it's one type of things, depending on the spin. On the other hand, there are other things where you can prove by, by different means. Ah, no, no, it's not essentially. I want to give it another, yet another corollary. And uh, maybe more about that. There is some, some I deprised it, coming, he may give lecture and, and next Friday uh, related to that. And the, another thing is concerning the following, I said the following question. So let me give an example. So I already mentioned that. If we have a simplex, and dimensional simplex, and in Euclidean space, and it has some dihedral angles. So there are faces, and there are dihedral angles between these faces. And now imagine I have a curved linear, sim uh, curved linear simplex. And it has other in angles. Now this angles, of course, variable, yeah, because curved linear, it are variables, but less this means the supremum of these angles, right? So, so, so it's angles. So, what, what, what I say, what is impossible under certain conditions, this you cannot have, provided all faces have positive mean curvatures. So, if you start deforming your simplex, and so making the faces slightly more convex, naturally you expect. So, if you do it in, the, in here and you enlarge it, of course, this angle become bigger, and you say it always happens like that. And uh, so, what is the status of that? And, uh, uh, how, how, how this, this, this can, be, can be done? What is definitely, I think, uh, with, with using, using, this, using this theorem, you can prove it in any dimension, in n dimensional simplex. On, yeah, the first one is flat. Yeah, let's come to the simplest case. Imagine simplex is flat, and this deformation also flat. <coughs> can be enlarge angle, you cannot enlarge angle. And this is a kind of elementary geometry, and, but not quite trivial. You cannot do it. So given convex simplex, you move the faces, some of the angles goes up and some goes down. You cannot make all, all smaller or all bigger. And this is a kind of nice exercise to do, which is non-trivial. I mean, simple, just one line. Well, can I replace simplex by as a polytops. Yeah, that's a big question. That's exactly unclear. It, 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 it isn't clear. So it is, uh, for some, probably you can know, for simple ones, you, you know it's impossible. But for, in general, it's unclear. Here, this, this guy, Ari Price, that told me that if you have, again, high dimensional polyhedron, and <coughs> it is simple. So at every point, you have only kind of the minimal number of faces in general position. Then you cannot do it infinitesimally. And this follows from some kind of Hodge theory. It's not kind of elementary. But infinitesimal deformation. And for global, it's unclear. For flat deformation. And he will, he, he will come here. He's exactly invited here for this purpose to discuss. But here you see it's about curved light. In dimension three, there is some guy who, who claims to prove it, but I'm slightly worried about when angles. It is significant difference in geometrically. Well, all angles be, be, be big or small than pi over two. Because this very special spherical geometry for angles which are smaller than pi over two. Of course, polyhedra where all angles are less than pi over two are product of simplices. Like cube, for example, or simplices by the regular simplex. You multiply them. And for those, this argument proves that if you have such a polyhedra in Euclidean space, which is product of simplices, and the simplices have all the dihedral angles less. In pi over 2, you can do the deform it, keeping faces with positive mean curvature without enlarging some of the angles. You cannot make angles small. And this follows again from this kind of from this argument. Argument is as follows. So when I have this simplex, I, I, there is kind of you can smooth it like that, taking kind of small neighborhood. And, and when you smooth it, kind of scaly curve, mean curvature here depends on this uh, the amount of mean curvature depends on this angle. Mean curvature depend only on how of the epsilon, but the amount depends. And, and, and then you compare it to the standard model, to the flat one. So this is, has positive, this is, after the second procedure, we have positive curvature operator, and the theorem applies, except you must be careful what happens at the vertices. And characteristic feature of these triangles, what happens, this kind of this piece of spherical geometry, very simple but essential. Is as follows that in Euclidean space, you have a simplex triangle, you can enlarge it 
enlarge it kind of like that, but it doesn't become bigger. It becomes actually more, more smaller and smaller. However, if you have spherical simplices, and they all sides are greater than pi over 2, it will do, simply is dual to our polyhedron, then this cannot happen. If you have a, if you have a in spherical simplex, all faces, are, uh, all a degree with pi over 2, and you enlarge them, it becomes only bigger, in a very precise sense. And you, this is what you can use to, to make this argument kind of rigorous. But when again, funny, when you look at the bottom of that, something happened to some twisted Dirac operator, and all action takes only on co-dimension two skeleton. What the hell the object is there? What are the correct objects in, involved? Yeah, it's some kind of limit of this Dirac operator. You go to the limit, there is no limit in the usual sense. And it certainly have absolutely kind of <coughs> begs for, to find correct definition and concept what is the zero operator. And this problem, I, I think, is crucial here, understanding, generalizing concept of a zero operator for this purpose. It will be not an operator, it will be not quite defined, but we will have enough structure to prove all that. I see. Isn't that related to your norm? Hmm? No, it's not. It's, it's just it's a kind of elementary proof plus this. And then this, I mean, there's some computation with positive curve, which operator is kind of a Simple, simple kind of linear algebra, kind of messy, let's see, one-page computation in this paper. But the point it has is kind of, you see, a posteriori, it may even prove that for flat polyhedra, right? If you can do, you see, a little bit, if you don't careful, it immediately works for, for all angles and prove it for all this polyhedra. And uh, of, of course, even for this pro product polyhedra, it's not totally obvious. It's, it's easy, you see, when, when angles are all, this elementary lemma reduces it to something simple. But in, in principle, it can give you something which you cannot get by elementary uh, argument. And uh, because you see, there are many terms in there. And you, this were a rough argument, and they, some of them cancel some of your favor, and it's rather, rather, rather tricky. It's exactly about the stability, what stability means for this problem. And so this is how you use, how you use, uh, how you use <coughs> A Dirac operator in one essential point, which is, as I was explaining in the first lecture, this fundamental difference of using just usual Dirac operator or Dirac operator to with some, with some vector bundles. It's like we can see the differential equation without right-hand side or with right-hand side. On one hand, it's a weak term. If you like Laplace equation plus equals something, this something is a weak term. However, this exactly which control geometry of the object. And for, for that reason, when you prove subject with Dirac operator per se, you get topological result, just index, index non-zero, subject non-zero, but tell you nothing about geometry. The moment you introduce that, this you can build to your pleasure with remembering subject of the geometry. And the, and the same will happen to the second method, which was introduced by Sean Yao, I guess following thesis, which I never exactly read. They, they had many of this construction, but in different language sometimes hard to decipher, that using minimal surfaces. And uh, they, again, gain a lot if instead of minimizing the functional, <coughs> so you have now manifold x, you have hypersurface y, and in, instead of minim minimizing just call area, just, for, just to skip, uh, just for simplicity to keep in meditation, instead of minimizing area y, you subtract M measure of what they bound. So it, it bounds something on this side. It, because what is bound not essentially crucial, it actually will be not a function, it will be, be closed close one form, right? So but exactly where you make this cut off in material. But you have this, uh, some measure here. And measure is no constant measure. And a priori. If it's constant, it's just usual so a bubble, and this will be a solution of that. We have this function mu, mu on the space. The surfaces have exactly been covered to me, extremely one. And using these, you can do something else and some. But then you run into the problem of regularity of this. And, and so it was from the, from the very beginning, it was a big problem. When it, the, the, the logical argument is as follows. That once you have this, you now I have to look at my paper. When you have this y, and it, uh, y and, and x, and it minimizes this functional. So I call it area, symbolically. It means volume co dimension 1. Y minus measure what it bounds. Right? 
so the, so the first variation of that uh, will be integral of this. It, it, it is uh, variation of this area and variation of that. So the first variation is integral of this mu over y. So extremal one. So the extremal one will have mean curvature exactly equal to this mu. You see, it's mu is directed function. It's not quite function. Yeah, it's important what's co-orientation. And this is kind of crucial to remember how, how you, from which side you look. And it's kind of, if you do it in the wrong, you get kind of sign here crucial, yeah, because positive or negative, say, essential. But the second variation is, is another matter. In the second variation, it is as follows. So, and, and so what's important about second variation? Because the moment is really minimizing, you know, second variation must be positive. And this second variation is a certain operator on here. So some operator become positive. And the quantity here is as follows. It is, um, so if you take the second variation, you take normal direction and weight with some function psi of, of, this, of this function. I don't know how we call it. Called A something, yeah? It is equal to integral one thing is a kind of that like for Laplace operator that dy and, and here you have one half and here you have scalar curvature of y minus some term which I describe in a second psi squared dy and here is a kind of important term, and this important term is, is n times, here is a mean curvature, which is on the hypersurface, if, if, it is, if it is extreme or the same as my function mu, squared n minus 1. And here is a, quite essential, here is, it will be normal derivative of my function mu in the direction in the direction of uh, nu is a, it depends on co-orientation, so it's sign dependent. And you see they have different scaling, but it's kind of strangely now, but it's okay. And uh, plus scalar curvature of x. So there is this kind of term. And you see what, what happens that this very much in your favor. So this is good because it eventually makes you what you want, of course, this some manifold have positive scalar curvature, so you can use induction or something. And uh, and this is against you, this derivative. So and scalar curvature of the ambient space, of course, in your favor. And when you in the end of the day, so what you do, once you have that, you know this positive operator is positive, you take first eigenfunction and construct a new metric over this y. Is it the huh? Is it the middle term you wrote? Sorry. Confused. Sectional curvature of y? Sectional curvature never enters here. No, no. This term, last term you wrote? It, it, it is a normal derivative of my it mean curvature and his scalar curvature of the ambient manifold. It, it is coming from where? It, from it, the it, second it, term of this last equation or the. No, no. This, are you describing what this is? Ah, okay. okay. Right? Because it's not to repeat it. Yeah, this is expression everywhere here. It's separate from x. x, in, in, everything internal, everything ex external. And therefore, when you change properly, so you have my y in x, it has some induced Riemannian metric, g sub y. And what I do, I multiply it by real line or by circle, whichever I want. And, <coughs> and I take first, so this operator. So this is second variation. So I, I like this oper to take operator corresponding to this energy. Take it first eigenfunction. And because it's positive, it's positive eigenfunction. That the model is that the metric which I obtain here will be invariant under this action. And this is right. And its scalar, it, 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 it scalar curvature will be A plus, plus something positive. Plus, yeah. So when this, this quantity is sufficiently positive, again, for example, if it's a minimal surface, this term disappear. So if this was positive, then that would be positive. And otherwise, we have here. And just to have an idea, 
So what, what are basic examples? You see, this is kind of a, it's almost the same as if Y itself here is symmetric. It's not quite the only after stabilization. You stabilize, and this again principle. You, it's hard to work with the space itself. You always multiply it by high dimensional Euclidean space and look at the metric invariant under the action of the space. And, and, and all inequality is now related to that. But that's almost as good as original manifold, but not quite. It's almost as good, but not quite. But you can pretend up to some point that this original manifold had the property. And the basic example, which is look at this concentric spheres. They are all exactly extremal and, and kind of and minimal, you know, strictly. What are the functional, the mean curvature itself, right? So if you take now in the Euclidean space mean curvature of those and solve this problem, of course you come back to this. And because they make a family, they're actually minimizing, not only extremal but minimizing, right? And so at any time you have this picture, you can take more general manifold, feed this in. So you imagine you have, oh, so, so it's just a typical example. Now I'm saying, aha, take the following manifold. Remaining manifold. Here it will be exactly what it was. It has po po positive, positive uh, mean curvature, at least as positive as here. And this has as positive as here. And inside, its scalar curvature is positive. And distance between these two, as big as it was. And then if I construct this very function, I can construct it with this called kind of small gradient. It means that inside there will be the IP a hypersurface, which has mean curvature at every point, as, I'm sorry, scalar curvature as big as this sphere. And now if you come, 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 again uh, combine this with the previous thing with scalar curvature operates, when it's mapped to the sphere, you can say, aha, you, you, this, this kind of cannot happen. Again, using the Dirac operator argument, and the one of the basic corollaries is as follows. If you take a punctured sphere with two punctures exactly in two opposite points, you cannot enlarge its scalar curvature and enlarge the metric at the same time. If you take three points, it's probably not true. It's very highly unclear. See, our original theorem of LaRue was without punctures, and this was about closed manifold. And now it's about two punctures, and this uh, applies to give some non-trivial information for all manifolds with boundary, right? Because kind of many manifold can be, it only, not, not only for this manifold, but anybody who maps, maps here, but again, for spin manifold. The moment you change topology, you have to bother about spin. And this is about two points. And actually, even for dimension, even for dimension, for surfaces, I'm not certain in dimension th in about three points. Or, or if the points are not opposite. I take two sphere, usual metric, puncture out of two points. One point is okay, of course, because I can take this and opposite. Take two points which are not opposite. Can they enlarge the metric? and simultaneously enlarge the uh, sectional curvature. For two points, it is. OK. And so, but, uh, so it is a rather delicate argument using both Dirac operator and minimal surfaces. So it's a, a, another kind of argument. And the last one, the last kind of uh, argument where, where mm, the, the Dirac operator doesn't end, it's purely, it's a purely uh, variational method. So just maybe just for summary, so what we had one. So one kind of would think about the spheres mean curvature greater than minus one. So this must be large. So here you spin and we don't know why. The second closely related, when you have this polyhedral, again, we need spin. We don't know why. We need angles to be less than pi over 2. We don't know why. But it's relevant to know. So we have this, these two, two results. Maybe because it's peak and spin, I was speaking about this much on here. There's another result of this kind, and, and this is as follows. So if I have, I think it's already true for, imagine I have Euclidean space on some other manifold, just in exactly to have this emphasized spin, which is 
is uh, admits admits a map here of let me say it I think as I'm saying correctly yeah, which, which admits in, in this direction distance decreasing map of positive degree and uh, and this proper map of non positive degree is distance decreasing so it's bigger than Euclidean space but again some somebody have to say it's it must be spin. Yeah. At some moment, somebody will be spin condition. So in Euclidean space, there will be no spin condition. If it was just Euclidean space itself. And I take a foliation of any dimension k. Then induced metric on this foliation cannot have scalar curvature greater than plus 1. So if it's homeomorphic Euclidean space, it's true as it stands. And it's extremely unclear. So what? Because so what, what, what it signifies, yeah. So it, it particularly it implies you can't have compact, simple leaves that have quite a few topological corollaries. But still, it looks rather mysterious. It says something about structural foliations. I couldn't quite figure out even that you cannot have foliation when all leaves have uniformly bound closures or something. But, Michel, this, isn't that related to what we are discussing? Yeah, it follows from your theorem, yeah. Yes. If you, <laughs> it's little effort, yeah. But you have to take non-compact version, it's add some L2 index to the table, it essentially follows. But this is what we were talking Right, exactly. Yeah, this is uh, so, 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 so bizarre. It's so just induced metric for Euclid more or less Euclidean geometry. And then it tells the leaves must have very, you cannot have a particular shape. They cannot kind of spread in all directions. And there is no way to understand it without that. And even formulated properly. But when you were saying that, that it was conceptually, uh, uh, what did you have in mind? I mean, no, but just to understand what is in geometry of the leaf, because you know, for example, if you for example, imagine it will be three-dimensional foliation, just example which we understand. Then we know the three-dimensional leaves, if they, because they have positive scalar curvature, each of them, in this, as a uniform, each leaf admits a map to, one dim to the graph, such that pullbacks of all points have diameter less than 10. So imagine now I'm asking this question. Imagine Euclidean space, can you make foliation with this, with this property, forgetting scalar curvature? And intuitively, no. And this would mean that the whole Euclidean space probably admits a map to this graph, and so each of these leaves simultaneously contracts. Is it true or not? So the theorem says it's kind of, in some sense, it is true. But in what precisely? Yeah? Ah, I see. So this is what you are Yeah, this is what I want to say. Yeah, there are intermediate statements, and it's unclear what. Uh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to find intermediate statements? Yeah, there, there, there may exist intermediate statements, which you can more, more prove by more sophisticated kind of using instead of the usual index theorem, more sophisticated index theorem. I see, I see. But this is what you are Yeah, and, and then I think for foliation, it may have many, many geometric consequences if you slightly modify it, yeah. So this is again, this is more sophisticated index theorem than this one. But of course, by the way, I'm pretty certain that your index theorem and this must have common kind of descendants. And there might be a, a results incorporating both foliation and all assets here. Right? Because all these have counterpart for non-compact manifolds when you use some kind of either L2 or sister index theorems, and they become generalized significantly. Even if you say, aha, I don't want spin, it's enough to have universal covering spin. And already you have to go to universal covering and use more 3K index theorems. But it's OK. But with your index theorem, I don't know if we have to do that. Because see, your index theorem, in a way, in a way, it says morally that if you have this manifold and there is foliation and positive scalar curvature, the manifold itself, under the little modification, carries medical positive scalar curvature. And it's true of codimension one. No, in codimension one, it's true. But it doesn't really say that. It says that there is a No, no, after some vibration, da, 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 after stabilization. Right. After stabilization, it kind of, kind of have it, yeah. But, not that, but this is a, uh, the, so the object where it exists is not properly defined. No. Yeah, that's the problem. And now, so when it comes to pure variational methods, So I emphasize kind of the geometric theorems. You see, they're kind of geometric and foliations. Uh, this geometry is somewhat hidden here, so you can still really take it, extract it. And now uh, two theorems where it's purely variational. One of them is as follows. If I have a manifold with two ends, like, for example, cylinder, and its scalar curvature is greater than n, n minus 1, which is scalar curvature of 
sphere. Then the conclusion is that if I take any hypersurface here, y, which separates the two ends, then this hypersurface y admits metric with positive scalar curvature. <coughs> if this is, I don't know, I, I, I forgot to say something. No, no, assume otherwise, no, assume it's not true. So no hypersurface admits such a metric. And, and, and with this, and then conclude because the proof will be using that by contradiction. Then distance between these two, this is two parts of the boundary, is less or equal than two pi over n. You see, it's n it goes to zero. You see, if you even for constant negative constant, if you take sphere, so the corollary of that, that if I have sphere, and I have inside, inside of a hypersurface, or actually you could mention two submanifold, which admits the metric of positive scalar curvature, like torus, then it cannot have big bands around it. In particular, its curvature must go to infinity with rate n. And it's absolutely not unclear kind of, for any other reason. We have, because we have to use the facts and torus. We have a torus inside, and we if it takes slightly different topology, it's unclear. And then this can be the same formulas for the ball. So the conclusion if we have a ball, and I have an n torus in this unit ball, then curvature of this torus at some point must be at least n up to a constant. Probably bigger. Actually, I think in the example, when text is making example, it looks bigger. And there is absolutely no hint of elementary proof of that. And that's kind of very bizarre. And because in the course of the proof, I use scalar curvature. Okay? And no matter how, how, how much I know about this curvature, after the argument, it disappears. It's a material. Right, and so this is a, an equality. And it can combine with known results of existence, non-existence, or medical positive scale. Like for torus, you know, it doesn't exist. Or there are exotic spheres, it doesn't exist. Of course, exotic spheres never embed. You see, it's important. But here it is true, even for immersions. Here it may be even immersed, immersed and it doesn't have to be embedded. And of course, the spheres do immerse into the ball. But if you take another exotic sphere, which does have a medical positive scale, we don't know. If there is any kind of constraints, any non-trivial constraints on this curvature. Right. Local constraint, by the way, it's easy to see co square root of n by local argument. By knowing, of course, they don't have this metric. But, uh, but global is, uh, uh, is n. And maybe even n to the alpha, maybe 1 plus epsilon, I guess. This is conjectural. But the, the argument we have, which is sharp for scalar curvature, is n. 2 pi over n, you see this, because the band around that must be quite narrow. And that's kind of, yeah. for this, there are two slightly different proofs. One of them, just, uh, yes, I, I, I'll discuss, uh, is in the spirit of what I was saying, and it is as follows. The boss all depends on, on the fact that there is a standard metric. I prefer separate to, uh, to say one coordinate to be half periodic. It looks like that. This kind of, this kind of this manifold. Where in, in this section, maybe torus, or maybe you create a space, but something flat. Matrix is just, you multiply it by a constant, you go from here to here. <coughs> this, each of these segments is pi over n. And, uh, and the metric of this thing everywhere is exactly n, n minus n, n, n by n minus 1. So as for the sphere. And it shrinks to 0 here, shrinks to 0 here, and it's this kind of weight function, so I keep forgetting it's something like, uh, you take integral of something, arctangent, that, that. there is some kind of particular function. You can, you can solve the, certainly ordinary differential equation, but it's easy. The KT equation, you can solve it. And then you compare to this kind of, and so it's, it's, and the theorem says this picture is extremal. You cannot stretch them further keeping this curvature. And there are two arguments to that. So one is, I, I look at this kind of tori. And they, 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 they have some mean curvature. And so on my, if the distance is bigger, I can construct here similar functions. So function goes like that. It is from minus infinity to or plus infinity to minus infinity. So what essential about this function is log concave. So it, it's, its first derivative goes like that. It's monotone. And, because, and, and then so you can, can construct it here. And then you 
and you can construct then this extremal object exactly as described, use it as a weight of the function big. And you see, because here there is boundary, a priori can hit the boundary. But this, because it goes to infinity, it creates a barrier, and so you can solve it. Right? That's very essential, this function blows up at infinity. And exactly at these two points. And it, it, and it blows up, and it, of course, on, on the first approximation, it goes like 1 over x, is the derivative of 1 over x squared. And remember, they must match exactly in this formula x and x squared, and there is a gap in this gap, because it's not exactly 1 over x, but a least little term, compensated by this number and, and my so on. So it's a very well balanced kind of situation. You do it, and then you make this situation, and then you, you know that your manifold time circle has this equivariant metric, but then it formally follows the manifold itself, have metric with Poisson scalar curvature, except there is a problem with singularities. And so when dimension n greater than 7, there are problems with singularities. I'll, I'll come in a second to that, but yeah, I indicate alternative proof because here, at some moment when we, for, to apply it, we, we may, may, may or may not use index theorem, but there is slightly different argument. Instead of this, at least for special topologies, when this was like torus cross interval, <coughs> what you can do instead of taking this section with these barriers, you can take minimum surfaces in this direction. And you can do the same process and reduce it to the situation with the whole picture invariant at the axiom of the torus. It's an inductive argument. We are explicitly using conduction. And this is, has advantages in a second to explain what, what kind. It give, gives you a weaker result, but it has advantages as far as singularities are concerned. So what about singularities? So it is kind of, kind of remarkable theorem that up to dimension 7, there is no singularities. And the first singularities appears when you take you know, S3 times S3 in S6, in a, I'm sorry, in S7 in R8, right? And take cone over it, and this cone minimizing. And this is a, a trivial, I mean, com com one line computation, somehow it was a big excitement because obviously the, the cone must be equivariant because equivariant becomes some ODE and it develops singularity. Right? But this was kind of a big thing, but non trivial part, why it doesn't happen before 7? And this computation was done actually by Simons. And it's really kind of the, 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 the most untrivial kind of in the whole theory. And then from that, from general principle, it was derived by, by Federer that in, in all singularities of minimal, really minimizing varieties have co-dimension seven, at least. And then there is a case, uh, extra case dimension eight. And they, this is exactly where this singularity, but it's unstable. You can show, in the, I, I was explaining it, let me repeat the argument due to Nathan Smail. It's very simple. His argument actually, I couldn't know. He's, he's, he used too much, he knows too much. But it's obvious just from general principle. This singularity must be unstable. And the proof is as follows. So what you do, you imagine you have, a, so one point is you have a cone, like this kind of round cone. Then you cannot move it inside without intersecting it. Argument. So here is a kind of lemma which I learned, you know, <coughs> maybe one of my first year at university. If you have a figure Y, topological, you only can put countably many of them on the plane. Okay. Only countably many. You can't put uncountably many of them on the plane. They cannot, you can't move it, you know, this is, there is no room. Yeah. And this is the same, because this cone, on the base of the cone, is not a hemisphere, it kind of doesn't sit on the one equator. Whenever you move it, it will intersect itself, and therefore you can't move it. So for cones, it's kind of obvious, right? Co cones cannot be moved for that reason. But now if you have a general thing, you know, in the limit it's a cone, so I take this, my hypersurface singularity, I take some family which move in, in this direction. Each surf barrier for the previous one, I can construct this family. And I'm claiming the singularity in some way it must disappear. It must be nowhere then set. It must be open, or open then set where there is no singularity. Because, so we, we, we can blow it up. So I have a cone and say, ha, I have moving cone, I'm done. However, the trouble is that this, when I blow it up, a nearby thing slides away. And so there is no contradiction. Yeah, in the limit, so what, what happens in the limit? In the limit, this point spreads up and you have one dimension singularity. It's also impossible. But in high dimension, does it work? If in high dimension, I have SRA singularity, it spreads off, and that's all. And then we have a problem. It's kind of very, very close. 
but it's, uh, it's still unknown high dimensions. And there were two papers, two competing kind of things. So the story was many years ago, in, in I think about 82 it was. Sean and Yao announced they can do it. And I remember we worked with Blade, okay, they don't forget it, so we dropped it. Yeah. But then in, 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 in 2017, they eventually published the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and because in between, Lockham published his papers when he claimed proving that. But his papers, nobody can read. And he is a very, very technical paper, very long. And then after their paper, he published another paper in IH8, which is almost full solution. It's almost proven stability up to a small error. So it doesn't say you can eliminate singularity by minimal, but they will be almost minimal, and which for all application is as good. However, so it, it's, it's short paper with five pages, but it refers to other to about 300 pages or something else. Nobody can read them. Some people read and say they're okay, those who could, who could manage. And he writes in a pretty bad way. So I don't know how, and Sean Yao published their proof. They proof kind of the much weaker statement. For, many, for some applications, okay, and for some of this, it's not okay. And it's still extremely heavy, very, very heavy. And it's kind of absurd because in all these inequalities, if you kind of forget singularity, they only help you. They make all the inequalities stronger. They add positive term to inequalities exactly equal to the weight of the singularity. But you, this, it, the trouble is the equation makes no sense. They become only better, all the equation better, but they make no sense, especially for minimal varieties, they still make sense, but you have to prove something. But for these varieties which are, have extra term, they have, they have no geometric sense. By the way, for, for minimal varieties, there is very good explanation of this trick which I was using of symmetrization. So I'm saying, aha, I have this minimal sub-variety when it's smooth, and then there is a new metric on this manifold times the line, which is invariant under this, and which kind of gains in positivity. So let me give geometric proof of that without using linearization. So you linear, linear, linear variety, use the fact that it is positive operated, has first eigenfunctions positive, this eigenvalue, multiply, use analysis. How to do it geometrically where it makes sense always, even for singular ones. And this is like that. So imagine I have like, like, like some subject like the and there's this is locally minimizing variety. And I assume it's really minimizing, so it's in small neighborhoods minimal. Therefore, if I add a little bit mu makes slightly positive, it still be minimizing, and therefore I have this little band surrounding it. But now this band will have positive mean curvature. Very, very narrow. It's, it's still singular, but it has positive mean curvature. Again, but by this theorem of non smell this will be actually non-singular. You can make it non-singular. In general, it will be singular. That's the problem. However, this singularity is very easy to correct, but creating something far from minimality. Because if you have this kind of singularity, what I can do it, I can push it a little bit inside. And the moment I do it, the singularity will disappear. Right? I'm sorry, oh, what I'm saying, what I'm saying now. It, it, singularity was very tricky. It will become like that, become simple singularity, like cross singularity. And when it's cross singularity, I can do backwards and make it smooth. And so I create something of positive mean curvature, and now it's smooth. So this small variation exactly corresponds to the solution of this linearized equation when they go to the limit. But th the point is they make sense even when it's singular. Now, we're not, the moment I have this thing with positive mean curvature, and this I was saying, this b b basic relation between positive mean curvature and scary curvature, if I have manifold with positive mean curvature, I, if I take a double, it has a singularity. But now this mean curvature can, can be regarded as singular scary curvature. And there is this construction I described. I, 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 I can smooth it and have positive mean curvature. So I can reflect it in this particular case. What I do, I would reflect it around this face, and I have positive mean curvature. And I keep reflecting, and I have this band. And now I go to zero and go to the limit. And, I, and then you can show in the limit. It is not quite trivial. But the limit will be manifold with positive scary curvature, and this, and this will and this will be invariant, so you kind of asymmetrize the problem, except if I have singularity. And do all that, <coughs> the limit may have wrong topology. It will be not topological cylinder if something blows up. And this happens because the moment when I have the singularity, a priori, a priori probably doesn't happen. When I take this band, this distance here, forget it, will be either too small or too big. They will not proportional distance. If I knew distance was more or less proportional, then it would finish the story. But maybe not. 
I keep forgetting, it's too small or too big, yeah, what, what might happen here. And I think it's too small. I, I want maybe to be bigger than, so and when I when this is shrink to the epsilon, this may behave in a bad way. And if not, it do. However, it will not work for this one. This is not, no, if you have a like, like sphere, which is minimal for this energy, <coughs> and indeed an induced metric has positive curvature exactly by, by means of you, in general, by this linearized operator, I don't see how to do it geometrically. And that's, of course, rather annoying. And this causes a problem for other because we, we don't understand it. Another thing which I don't understand, technical, and I just was surprised, I, I just couldn't find it in the literature, it must be, so, of course, known. If you consider, so what happens when you have manifold with boundary, in more general, you, you come with the following <laughs> variational problem. You have a domain or a Banyan manifold, and you have the following functional. It, it is a Dirichlet df squared plus some integral of the boundary. And here is some function, some weight. So, so it's a Dirichlet function inside plus extra term, some measure on the boundary. So there's this Y nice function on the boundary. Right? If it's inside, it's here. <coughs> so what, uh, what kind of operator are there? I couldn't find really any kind of, it's kind of obvious thing, a silver. Because I'm confused, Michel. What is the difference Omega in the uh, it's some function on the boundary. Omega is a function on the boundary. Smooth function on the boundary. And, and, and it's, it's my functional, Dirichlet functional. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. That's what I yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, as usual. Yeah, I always forget this term. Yeah. I always forget that. Right? So you have extra, extra weight. You, you, you integrate on the boundary. And this is okay, you can show it's really well defined because of this term, it makes sense, yeah. Sure, sure. For, 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 but I don't know where the, the, what, for example, corresponding operator with respect to which Hilbert structure you have to make operator in linear. Uh, this is Dirk, uh, Dirk, Dirk Leo von Neumann boundary conditions. No, 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 they're normal. Yeah, yeah, no, but this variable, you see, this is a F here variable, not fixed. We don't say it normal, oh, we just F. say integral involved. That the whole, it's kind of close <coughs> to this condition, but not quite. It's not quite. Right? And there is little proof why it makes sense. Yeah, you need some sobel of inequality, it makes sense. Because function with this regularity makes sense when you stick to the boundary. Right, exactly. So this integral makes sense. Yes, yes. Right. So the operator should, should give you exactly. Yeah, but which with respect to which measure? Because here is actually measure, right? There is a measure on the boundary involved, uh -huh. not only inside. So which measure to use to diag diagonalize it? And what will be of eigenfunction, etc. Yeah, well, Hilbert space is probably a sum of two Hilbert spaces, one for the boundary. Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. I'm not certain when you diagonalize which one will give you the right answer. Right, okay, sure. Maybe, maybe the sum, maybe the one. I don't know, but I couldn't find it in textbooks, I mean, on the, on the web. I don't know what are the, there might be key words which I don't know, right? Yeah. This is exactly what happens when you linearize this problem with main for this boundary and and the uh, uh, and so on. So this hmm? is the type of thing you get for the Berman kernel. Berman kernel? Yeah, which is a restriction in boundary. So yeah, but there, no, but there's so many kind of you know with, right, sure, sure. with PD there are so yeah, many yeah. papers and never never can find what you want. Yeah, but anyway, this uh, kind of simple we can figure it out. But yeah, no, there are computational. Okay, anyway, so let's make a little break and then we continue after the break. So in the last geometric theorem I want to mention, which is Unfortunately, not quite sharp, but more sharp is as follows. That if I have a cube, or actually maybe any kind of cube-shaped manifold, where topology is hidden, and again, the scaly curvature will normalize it greater than then of the sphere, then there are two opposite faces. So we have this di plus and di minus, d minus i and d plus i pairs of opposite faces. And so minimum of these distances will be less or equal is um, 1 over square root of n with some constant which is by pi uh, versus expected optimal case. Actually, it's not quite clear what is op expected optimal case, but there is one example which is close to optimal. When you take just sphere and, uh, and inside this kind of cube, 
and you can project it. So this will be my cubical picture with the geometry of the sphere. And the distance between these two and the sphere is, what, is of this order. But Misha, is this constant depends on them? No, I, I'm sorry, no. It's constant. It's, uh, so it's something for kind of four. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a, you can prove it's pi over 2, but, the, but by pi uh, differs from this one, which you have in this picture. And here's one of the square root of it. And so what's amusing here is there is no topology as it stands. And, and so, but what probably true is also for, for hypersurfaces of positive mean curvature, probably the same is true if you have this hypersurface divided into the species about the system equality. And, but then this exactly has some problem because of this variation linear problem, which I don't know how to handle at this point. But this is true in the sharp inequality. It's not clear what should be the sharp inequality, by the way. It is um, because in dimension two, it is pi, yeah. So extremal configuration, it's not but obvious what's the extremal configuration, by the way, for dimension two. Uh, extremal configuration, you take a sphere, take two tiny little holes, and takes covering of very high order, so it will be kind of here very narrow, it spreads very much here, like that. And this distance will be about pi, and this will be as, by, as big as you want. You can make this as big as you want, and this about pi. And, and this, when you make this argument, it doesn't come to this picture. It's, 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 it's by, by, by a fact of square root of a two, it, it's worse than that. But this is not optimal picture either. You can show, you can make better than that. But here. So but it's, un it's unclear if there is extremal picture. And for with mean, with mean curvature, strangely enough, uh, at the moment I'm not certain I, I, can, I, I, can, I can prove it. So that's it's here. And so what else one knows and, 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 and what we don't know? So now I want to make some a, a, a general remarks. So on one hand, we have kind of questions, and then we have some a geometric results and geometric equation, and there are techniques. As far as techniques are concerned, so there are two methods, and both have kind of some parallelism in them. So one, when you have Dirac operator, and what's crucial when you twist it with a vector bundle. And that's completely changes perspective. And also, then you have these minimal varieties. So we minimize of y. And this corresponds kind of to Dirac itself. And then there is extra term. You can add measure, given measure of the complement. I'm sorry, of the bottom of the half of the complement. And this exactly also because like this uh, knows the geometry. This, the property of this, of this vector bundle, this connection, what it is and how it enters this form depends on geometry, unlike the whole operator, which only remembers scalar curvature, and also this one, yeah. When you construct this function, you can do it, uh, accommodate the geometry and derive some geometric information. And so, but then, kind of the uh, hidden relation between these two methods is that there are certain formula. And here is, it is a uh, Weizenbach, Gifnerovich, Schrodinger, I know who formula is. It's square of Dirac operator twisted with this E equals to positive operator. By the way, it's also not as easy, this operator. Yeah, you know this? It is a Bochner Laplace operator, so it just corresponds to energy. When you integrate, it takes square of the all covariant derivatives of a section, then there is one quarter of scalar curvature, and plus term depending on E, some curvature of E. This, by the way, also not as to, to understand its nature, it's not only positive, it's more positive in some sense than usual Laplace operator. <coughs> and this, Difference on positivity, the best, there are two ways to do it. One, there's some kind of local formula, cutoff formula relating to apparatus. But, but it doesn't give you a good intuition. What is much better is the cas final formula. So the cas final formula tells you why diffusion along this path in the vector bundle will be always faster than diffusion without, without connection. And the reason is very simple, because the cas final formula says how you what will be parallel, what will be kind of how heat flow in this vector bundle. So you have to take orbit here, then lift it here, it's held and still transported, defined, go there, and then average over the, over the Wiener measure. So this rotation in the bundle cancels things. 
So it cancels faster than here. Here nothing cancels. It's just like in this direction. Here it rotates. So it's the extra consideration. Therefore, the more curvature in your bundle, the better this inequality. However, there is no simple way to, to write it down, this, this error term. Right? And so this is a kind of essential, essential for, for, for many purposes. It yeah, indicates some problem when immediately this kind of uh, this comes up. But in any way, this and, and the formula which is here, I think the key formula, which is very simple, but also in, yeah, yeah, this of course in, in one way we will say this pure algebraic formula. The moment you wrote it is like this pure algebra. However, the, 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 when you relate d and d squared, the, the kernel of one another is analysis, you integrate by parts. And that makes it unapplicable to many forms of boundary. Or at least there is tricky boundary term, ta -da -da. And so Dirac operator works extremely bad with many forms of boundary. You have to do some very tricky points and do something. And uh, the best which is done, which I must admit I never could, could believe, could convince myself works, is so called partitioned index theorem, usually coming back to John Rowe. And so they say, in effect, what they kind of theorem they prove, that they will have manifold with positive curvature, just an instance of that. With the boundary going like that, imagine here is a torus in the section, yeah? You cannot have it with positive scalar curvature. And, and, and here is the boundary in the spin case. And again, you can, uh, you can imagine you have any kind of handles, but they must be spent. By, by minimal surface, you can prove it. But it is here, you don't need even this infinite tube. You just take any cut off with the size bigger than uh, to, to, to pi over n, you know, it cannot go. However, from the point of view of Dirac operator, it's bizarre because there is a boundary. Mm -hmm. And the tricky point is, so when you, ha you, when you have such a thing, so you can produce lots of kind of section of your Dirac operator. But, you, but to do that, you have to go to some covering of the space. And then you go to the covering of that. But so if it were tube rather thick, and so, and then you don't have to go to much covering. So and, and here is something positive, and you have a lot of section. So they must concentrate here, and so they give you a lot of spectrum of this thing. But when you go to the covering, the spectrum will go up. And if manifold doesn't, if it exponentially shrinks, it's unclear how it could be. We you know a posteriori is true. Moreover, it seems they cannot shrink exponentially if, 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 under this condition. At least this is one of the questions we don't know. However, they somehow they manage by some manipulation to avoid this difficulty. Right? So if you know the manifold doesn't shrink, right, more or less kind of thick at infinity in a very precise way, it's okay. This we can prove by, well, by argument I said. Yeah, because there are too many sections, therefore they must concentrate here and give you a lot of section of this uh, of this, even of Dirac itself. Yeah, I cannot have too many of this whatever operator localized here. Yeah. But, in, but still, it's very strange you cannot do it. So, so this is an interesting point here. Right, and then, of course, and, but the, here the key formula, which is also kind of, kind of only semi-algebraic, which is local, is the Gauss, Gauss formula. And the Gauss formula is saying the curvature of manifold and curvature, curvature of some manifold related. And so it is not quite a trivial formula, because there is some cancellation involved. Because you see, the curvature of this depends on the second derivative, embedding the first derivative, and this second derivative sure. should be third derivatives, but it cancels. And this, however simple, that makes the uh, thing work. If you slightly change your Maribanian geometry, take fins or whatever, poof, everything dies. You don't have that. And so there are these formulas. And then they can be uh, they can be embodied here in Dirac operator, in some analysis, and here is minimal surface. And, and this reminds me of an analogy, as people say, what are we as a human being? So we kind of body for what? We just weak of our genes, and genes tell you what to do. And this body, you can put genes somewhere and do something, and do the same. Yeah. Therefore, here is the same picture. There's formulas, and then they embody it in some analysis, and the analysis does what the genes tell. The question: What is the actual information there? How to understand it? We know what genes are. Actually, we don't, right? Because philosophically, we don't understand because information in genes, which may change, the variable, still they determine kind of our our phenotype, which means there is information there, but this information is not readable unless you have phenotype. So it's very tricky kind of chicken and egg problem. And here it's something like that yeah, also. So there might be hidden information in these formulas, which exist independently on, on this analysis. And if you understand this, we understand many other things.
Misha, when one looks at the heat expansion for the manifold with boundary, yeah. then what happens is that you get the extrinsic curvature of the boundary yes. which is entering. Right, but it's for curve, but not for Dirac operator. Not for Dirac operator. Yeah, for Dirac operator, you need this top, you know, topless projection to the tie. It's kind of mess which you lose con control of geometry. Right. Uh, it's very unclear what ha because they see the point, but you, when you work with complete manifolds, uh, the, the point is how you do that. You use cutoff function with very small, uh, very very small gradient. Ah, no, but it depends on which boundary condition you take for the Dirac pair. Right, of course, but there are these topless operators. Right. No, no. What I mean is that uh, so the type of uh, boundary condition that uh, uh, John Rowe was taking was it a global? No, no boundary condition. Not the whole point. He was doing like some kind of doubling, oh, and then yeah. using because index was located in infinity. The point is because everything located in infinity operators are local and these don't feel. But the computation which I see in my mind, if the exponentially compressed, it will propagate too fast and still may come here. In naive, in naive uh, logic. And that's hidden in some kind of formalism I couldn't check if it's correct or not. I'm just it's probably there's no reason to believe being incorrect. But usually all this argument and see in model example, you see what happens. And here you don't. And this uh, on the other hand, a posteriori, I know it's true by different reasons. It's my strongest true. Yeah. But, for, but for completely different reason, which is absurd. I mean, if they have and uh, all of this argument I described, they have many variations and really different argument, and in, in secretly the different features. And then that's uh, both encouraging and confusing. It's encouraging and confusing. So what are, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's a kind of an issue from the technical point of view. Forget about what the, you prove. You have these formulas and they develop and, and these bodies kind of interact among themselves. But this formula seems to be separate, but I, I, probably they're not. Yeah. It's, it's one thing. Another thing is stability question. So let me indicate what the stability problem is. So I take this model. I think, for example, you have a torus. And you know it doesn't have metric with positive scalar curvature. Imagine you allow a little bit negative curvature. Of course, if you don't say anything, you can kind of scale it and become converges to zero. It's not interesting. Imagine you still have a kind of bounded shape. Let's try the yes, e easiest thing. Imagine the overall geometry is more or less fixed. Namely, imagine I have a family of metric on the torus converging to the limit, which is just continuous metric. And, and, and all this metric, scaling curvature of this, greater or equal to minus epsilon. So it converges to zero. So in the limit, you have but the potentially positive scalar curvature. We know for, if it were smooth, it would have positive or neg non negative scalar curvature. You know it doesn't exist. Now what happens in this case? And with Dirac operator, I don't quite understand at all so what to do with that. With minimal surface, on the other hand, how you just to understand what happens, let me see what again, how we can use how we can use this soil bubbles. So you see, remind me what you do with the torus, how you prove subject of the torus with minimal surfaces. If it has positive scalar coefficient, delete this inside of, of this minimal sub-variety. We, we cannot say this minimal sub-variety has positive mean curvature itself, positive scalar curvature itself, but if I multiply it by a real line, then on this product that would be a metric invariant under this transition with positive scalar coefficient, which is most as good, I repeat it, it's not as good like that. If you repeat it, Seven, uh, time after time after time, I will adduce, produce on the Euclidean space invariant metric with positive scalar curvature, which is certainly impossible because it must be flat. Now imagine, <coughs> now I want to prove <coughs> that what happens with in the flat case. Imagine a uh, manifold has zero scalar curvature. Then apparently there is no contradiction, but I want to show that actually manifold is torus, flat. So what you do? And you do the following. So, so, so the, the key point I'm showing that if I have this minimal thing, it will slide around here. It will be not never localized. It cannot be actually minimal. Imagine it was actually minimal. So it, what you, may, you may slide it a little bit, and then it becomes slightly bigger. But if it becomes there slightly bigger, I can again introduce this measure term, a little bit bubble it up. But the moment I do it, I remember there was m squared term there, positive. And that would positive scalar curvature. So they slide around. And if you look slightly more carefully, they might be totally geodesic as well. So the same is true in the limit here. The limit object, a continuous metric, all these minimal surfaces slide around. 
and they all, in a way, might be totally geodesic, but they're tricky, right, in what sense, right? So what happens? It's unclear. So this, for example, I just say it's kind of very plausible to show the limit must be flat, but I, I don't see I don't see the proof. And also is Dirac operator also unclear because so you, what you would like to know that when you go to the limit of the metric, the Dirac the spectrum of the Dirac operator may only go, I keep forgetting, up or down. Right? So so if you had So if it's twisted or, or, or yeah. no, yes, Dirac operator per se. So what happens with spectrum? But, uh, but uh, it's like scaly curve, scaly, it's, it's, it's scaly curvature may become only in the limit, only more positive. So Dirac operator also must become only more positive. However, if you look from this perspective, if you write it like that, this, if I have some manifold, like flat, and they're approximated by some metric query closely or slightly variable, this becomes more positive. Right, when I go away from positive, to opposite state must become slightly more negative, but it's not true. So this term become more negative, but this become more positive. And so it's very tricky, so what happens? You do know that the Dirac operator, its positivity has strong constraint on geometry of the manifolds. Yeah, this is a, if you look at the, it was a, in a, a general term is observed by Waffe and Witten, and it says if I have a big manifold, then, spectrum of the Dirac operator must be close to zero. It cannot be, right, for, for usual Dirac operator, which, the usual delta Laplace operator is kind of paradoxical, but you can enlarge manifold like a, a three sphere starting, bigger, 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 but spectrum doesn't go to zero. You know that, right? Which is, of course, many times people ask me how to prove that, and oh, you know, it's, it's, it's expanders, right? there are expanders. You can incorporate expanded geometry into that. But for Dirac operator, it cannot happen. Because Dirac operator a priori may have spectrum, no, no index, and if things become bigger, here the IPA vector bundles with small curvature and carrying non-trivial topology, twist them, you have, now you have non-spectrum, non, non but this is just perturbation, adding that is just small perturbation. Therefore, original one must, may have non-zero modes, but you'll have small eigenvalues. Therefore, it has the same effect, so, but in the limit, of this matrix, it cannot be anything. It cannot really become kind of outrageously positive or negative. I keep forgetting when I say semi-negative, semi-positive, because you have to remember this or that. And this depends, of course, on the gradient of the gravitation. And it's very difficult to incorporate uh, Earth gravitation, especially with this kind of planet, into the mathematical language. You know, It's not a joke. You cannot say it otherwise. Rather, I think I, I was saying for an inexpressible mathematical language, left or right, uh, up and down, and just and this conventional and very, for that reason, very hard to remember. What upper continuous or lower continuous? Well, it goes up or down, but in one certain direction. <laughs> no, it's impossible indeed, yeah, there's a good reason for that. I mean, it's psychological, it's, it's, it's because how your brain can decide it, yeah? So you have to remember gravitation all the time. It's, 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 it's tough. Yeah, in algebra, it's left and right adjoint functions, we should, should. No, but well, how no left and right? No, no, how, no, what is left and what is right? Yeah. Right, because... Uh, absolutely, if you forget, forget about weak, weak, weak force, yeah, and you speak to a person from other galaxy, how you can explain it? Imagine they didn't discover this experiment, they cannot tell what's left or what's right. No way, absolutely, right? <laughs> and, it's, and in your brain kind of it doesn't have it built in this machinery. Though your cells, as you know, they all have some polarity, all biological cells, yeah? They either left or right, it was discovered by Pasteur, yeah, you know? It's kind of rather, rather, rather amazing. But so, but, but anyway, so, so for Dirac operator, it has only partial, only partial this positivity and negativity. And uh, <coughs> but on the other hand, there is one extremal case. If I am not mistaken, I keep forgetting the, this name of this uh, people who done it. Uh, uh, that if you have manifold of constant negative curvature, it's extremely in the following sense, because if you, uh, because you know that in the universal covering, you know exactly the bottom, what is the bottom of this, uh, of the usual Laplace operator. On the other hand, if it's sufficiently large, it has lots of this flatness and have lots of sections 
very many kind of zero moles of the twisted Dirac operator. And, they, and, and this apparently kind of extremal for this purpose, but I, 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 I've forgotten exactly. So, so the, again, the, the, the idea is that if you have manifold whose in, in the universal covering uh, spectrum of, of, of Laplacian is away from zero, then spectrum of Dirac also cannot be too, too much. You can have too many, too many some small eigenvalues. On the other hand, if manifold is too large, it has too many flat bundles, and you can twist with them, and you produce lots of these moles. And so it shows that there are strong constraints in geometry, even when here, you see, even for scalar curvature being here negative, but greater than minus here and, and minus one. But in some sense, it's extremal. So what is unknown, however, for negative curvature, for example, for such for hyperbolic manifold, is that, and this is um, that if you have this constraint on geometry and per given topology, it volume, it volume uh, cannot be too small, too large. Yeah, when you scale it down. Yeah, when you scale it like yeah. so this, its volume must be, so volume must be smaller than for this one. So this has maximal possible, or minimal possible volume, what not, sorry. The, the volume of the standard model. So, yeah. okay, right. So that's, that's unknown. However, what's interesting is it's almost known in dimension four, if it is complex hyperbolic manifold. And this by, by the work of Lebrun, when you use uh, cyber quitting equation. So the, he, he has sharp, he, he, I, no, he proved slightly different thing. <laughs> he proved the bound on the integral takes k the curvature, norm squared dx. And if manifold has certain topology, the, because you see, this is scale variant integral. It's very nice integral, scale variant integral. The trouble is, he use, he, in his paper, use absolute value. Maybe you can use only negative part of this. Positive probably doesn't enter. But even that is quite remarkable inequality because it's sharp for not only for not only for complex hyperbolic space, which you expect for, for other reason, but for all algebraic surfaces of general type. The, in any algebraic surface the codire dimension is whatever the maximum, then you have the sharp inequality of this kind. But this integral must be greater than something. And topological invariant with that. Is it because it has this uh, rich constant curvature? No, 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 you don't use it. No, yes, it writes, it's a cyber quitten, and, and, and scalar curvature enters there. And the also has this huh? constant, uh, of course, it has a solution of. <laughs> no, but he's, uh, no, but constant curvature, you have to check how it's related to the original one. It's any, it's any curvature, you don't have to go. Of course, you can uh, relate it to constant, but uh, what happens to this integral, it's another story. He doesn't, use, he doesn't use existence of constant curvature matrix. In high dimension, it's not true. In, in, yeah, in high dimension, you still have constant curvature, but this, yes, is not true. In high dimension, you can you see that the trouble is different between dimension three and four. <coughs> and, and, and high dimensions, in high dimensions, say if you have non-spin manifold, simply connected dimension more than five, it always has matrix of positive scalar curvature. All the integrals, you can completely kind of control them, big, small, whatever. And if spin, you know exactly this is one invariant which give you abstraction in some dimensions. The topology is minor, but in dimension four, it's, uh, in dimension three, you can put, it follows from Perelman argument that in dimension four, it, this uh, Lebrun by by uh, Seibert Witten, and generally don't know. So the, the na naive conjecture, of course, that if you have a hyperbolic manifold and scalar curvature is small, the volume must be large. Because it's, not, that cannot, it's true if you replace scalar curvature by rich curvature. But this we, we, we don't know. So, what, what is the remark on codire dimension? Uh, sorry. So if uh, this inequality, this scale is some topological invariance from churn number, whatever. And this is true if this x was algebraic surface of a general type. With codire dimension equal to, to 1. I keep forgetting because there are enough holomorphic sections in the. In the in the uh, canonical bundle, canonical bundle. <coughs> and this because I have written variant when you compute it, there is scalar curvature entering in the formula, the Dirac operator entering the formula, 
and you just write this uh, properly Lichnerovitz Weissenbach formula and just it comes up some little argument but I'm not certain that about the sign I think you only need negative part by logic but it's formally it's, it's, it's was written in his paper and so this is one one kind of problem conjecturally what you expect geometrically and we don't, don't know that and, uh, and another issue, as I mentioned, stability. What to expect when you, when you slightly perturb your situation, right? For example, let me give, uh, so you have manifolds like, like uh, you have sphere, you slightly perturb the geometry, curvature a little bit may go below on the sphere. And then what can happen, of course, you may have this bubble immediately emerging. But is it true there is really always a good core which will be un unchanged and this thing will be really as narrow as example show? In example show, you can make this thing lo lo localized as something of co-dimension two. But no, no, co-dimension three, yeah. Dimension three, for example, you have connected some. So these sections, you expect to have small area. And this what proven in some cases uh, is in this Penrose inequality. So when you go to the limit, all things disappears, and this and kind of becomes separate, and you come back, to, you converge to a sphere. But in what sense exactly to give a precise definition, you know, have to prove precise theorem, it's not so clear, right? Because lots of, lots of stuff, which, and this has kind of physical meaning, right? This is now universe, and other can go down, but the bridges are small, and this exactly motivates Penrose and this guy in their conjectures here, the specific models. So this is what is, what is, what is unknown. Another general question, close again related to that, saying that all the size of scalar curvature located in top dimension. And accordingly, what you may expect that if you say if, uh, that if you have a manifold of dimension n, the scalar curvature normalizes like that. Everything beyond the size of the sphere, so it may have a kind of bubble like sphere, but everything else will be concentrated of something of dimension n minus 2. Not even n minus 1, but n minus 2, right? So that manifold kind of, one way to say it, it admits a map which is cut to be in polyhedron of dimension n minus 2. And so pull, all pullbacks are small. And small, you expect them to be both small area-wise and size-wise. Yeah, but exact, now we can say carefully, we don't know. I, I, I say, in, the, in dimension three, we know there is such a map which is small size-wise, pullbacks have small diameter on one hand, and independently if it is three dimensional sphere, perfect result area-wise when it's sharp and I mentioned it also true. But it's not a map in this example, but uh, you have to think about this as a, this family of these two spheres represent this one-dimensional cycle in the space of two cycles. Right. And this is how we can think about that. What does it mean? You can slice manifold by small things. Slicing has different meanings. One, you take pullbacks of points, or it may be homological slicing. Yeah. And uh, we don't know what the different kind of examples suggest, suggest different, different possibilities. And this is absolutely unclear. On the other hand, if, if, if what I say would be true, this would probably imply, uh, the proof of this would imply a of conjecture. Which is, probably, which is probably not true, right? which is very unlikely to be true. And so, so this probably might, must not be true, or at least in some correct formulation should be not true. But of course we don't know that, how this, this go one from another. But we also know it of conjecture, a kind of parallel story, but it's, it's, at some point the two, two, two things diverge, as I mentioned. So one, because there, One is more, 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 more geometrical, geom no, in a very naive sense, na naive formulation here, you know, no, not, 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 not being true. So, what are um, other points maybe worth explaining? Maybe now we, we have a little bit of time, you ask me some questions, and I meanwhile can remember what else I, I have to tell you, which I didn't tell you yet. So when you were talking about the one-dimensional cycle in the two-dimensional cycles, which coefficients were in R or what? Two-dimensional. 
when you were talking when about I, no, no, when I'm speaking about this map, what is known, you have three-dimensional manifold, right. and scale is greater than some say one normalized. Then there exists a map to one-dimensional space, such that diameter of pullbacks, it must be complete manifold or something, uh, uh, otherwise must be careful. The diameter f minus one of all point, less or equal than 10, something like that. And we don't know if it's true, if it is n-dimensional, this will be n minus two-dimensional, and this is unknown. It's unknown. This kind of basic idea about the shape, but I'm saying if it were true, this would be suspiciously close to proving Novikov conjecture. I see. But uh, the FMS of the points, they have a non-trivial homology class? No, here we don't know nothing. Here we don't know. No, 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 no. no it's like in the sphere. It's, it's three spheres. It is non-trivial homology class in the space of cycles. In the space of cycles. <coughs> but here it's not that they are not even cycles. They are not even cycles. It's a, it's a de 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 deconstruction which we have. It doesn't give you cycles a priori. And here they have cross cycles, even two spheres. And this proof, not this actually a very, very, very nice and simple proof. So how you prove that? Let me may I prove that, yeah, because it's so simple. So I have S3 and have this family of spheres. And when you have this family sweeping around, among them there will be a minimal one. And there will be this, be tricky, but there will be, but not minimal in the sense minimizing area but minimum of index worth one. But then there is the following theorem, that you have to show that this one have small area, right? Because it's exactly minimax area, so this exactly was the proof. These guys didn't prove what I said. They didn't formulate it. They only say, aha, this sphere of index one, and this little argument of showing it's one imply another, must have area less than standard sphere. And what you use, that you know that we have, the forgetting all the story, there is the following fact, if you have a sphere, and look at the Laplace operator, and it's no its area, then the average of the first, eigen, first eigenvalues here extremely for the usual sphere. So there are low eigenvalues. How you prove that? I, I give the proof, and then it's, it's, it's forgotten, okay, all theorem are forgotten, who, 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 who that? Huber. Huber, Huber. You map it to the usual sphere with conformal mapping, but when you do it, of course, if you want to, you know, harmonic function, eigenfunction, go almost to eigenfunction, but you do problem with measures. Measures not being preserved. By the way, this is exactly a problem when you try to prove that big manifolds must have small eigenvalues. You map it to some, they're small, map it to the sphere, they pull back something from the sphere, but measure may be distorted tremendously. And here's measure distorted tremendously, but by simple topology, you can balance in such a way that it, it will be equipartitioned for every sphere. This measure, you'll have zero integrals long directions. And then when you pull them back, they give you comparison function for eigenvalues. <coughs> and you give immediately two or three. And therefore, there are the first two eigenvalues are small. And so you apply this, combine this with the, combine this with this um, formula for second variation, and immediately see how that's the proof. So it's quite, quite simple, but quite remarkable. And this, for, for strangely, doesn't work if topology is different from the sphere. Of course, when suppose you think it will be some other surfaces, because this, this theorem is not true anymore for, for when they are not spheres. It depends on, it depends on uh, conformal structure and with which degree it goes to the sphere. If you have a surface uh, of higher genus, and when you map it to the sphere with a lower degree, it's okay. But with a higher degree, it's not true, and we know it is not true because there are expanders. So, but here it still looks to be a very pro pro plausible bit to be true. And there is no clear understanding of what happens for high dimensions this respect. Mm -hmm. What happens for to, for to, 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 to <coughs> if there is anything comparable to that. Uh, or, so you really can sweep it by two-dimensional surfaces in such a nice, homologically nice way. But again, as I said, it will bring you a little bit suspiciously close to a Neukel conjecture. It's not exactly like that, wouldn't apply it, etc. But there may be some fundamental uh, abstraction uh, to the boss, uh, which may be uh, hidden and not uh, at all transparent, transparent here. Well, but again, this, uh, I just repeat, the most challenging thing is to find formalism which would 
incorporate both methods simultaneously, and the object will be not manifolds anymore, <coughs> but subject much more general objects. Because see, they're so soft. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very atypical for geometric geometry when you have something like convexity, something very rigid. It's object very, very soft. There are very weak links between them, which, however, sufficient for many purposes. How to, uh, how to, to uh, make, bring it to the open? So what is keeping the thing together? So, so what, what, why I find the subject so different and interesting in, in Riemannian geometry is the most kind of, I think, p p profound structure which we know here. Yeah, it's incomparably, kind of, you can, if you look at other theorems in Riemannian geometry, they're much more primitive. The logic there is much more primitive. And another point, I'm, amazingly, that even when you have, you replace condition by scaly curvature by sectional curvature, it doesn't help. In geometric theorems, like I described, very simple one. When you have the square cube, and the, 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 uh, if you just say sectional curvature is greater than plus one, how to show the distance between some of them might be like over one square root of n? There's absolutely no way to see it by, by usually everybody in geometry. It's, and, and, and again, funny enough, a scaly curvature or sectional curvature, you yes, assume many for the spin, so in the proof. Ah, no, no, here it don't have to be spin. No, I'm sorry. You don't have to be spin, but you have to fight with singularities and some in high dimensions. You, sp there is no, no Dirac operator proof of this, which I can see. So, and this Dirac operator, again, that interesting point that you make the artificial argument and you go to some limit object, there are apparently something related to Dirac operators which are not Dirac operators. What are these objects? All the time you have to go like that because you don't know, you don't have the right concepts. So, so th this I think is more or less what I, what I wanted to say. And, uh, and of course, th there are kind of not so many geometric theorems. Yeah, I just, uh, yes, I, I, I may bring forth, uh, well, I, I, I formulate it more or less. Everything I just want to repeat another one. Quite nice theorem. We had done quite, again, follow the proof. Uh, but uh, which certainly must have profound link with everything I said. And this theorem by, uh, by this guy, Shane Tam. And it, it, it says the following. If I take convex hypersurface in the Euclidean space, and then I change it from this kind of side, and uh, well, I, know, so I take another manifold corresponding to this hole, but it's convex. Maybe ball. Ball is good enough such that this has scaly curvature, non-negative, and mean curvature of this, so there are two statements. If I say mean curvature is here point-wise greater than mean curvature, then it's easier to show, it's impossible. You have glue in together, smooth the corner. But what's remarkable, even if this integral of, of this one cannot be, it must be necessarily smaller than the integral of mean curvature in this canonical picture. And, uh, I'll, and, and the proof is as follows. So, uh, so that you, if you have too much mean curvature, integral even, on mean curvature too much, you can propagate this positive curvature to infinity by solving some parabolic equation and arrive at the contradiction with positive mass theorem. I symptotic will be wrong. So you can redistribute, which I must admit I haven't studied that. You can redistribute, in some situation, mean curvature with, in the integral form with scaly curvature. And, and this very well corresponds to the fact that when you, uh, to the Witten proof of the positive mass theorem, when you write this Lichnerois formula with a boundary term. And this boundary term, when you write it, could be, could be, because see, this formula itself is algebraic, but if you remember, it came from d squared integration by part, it becomes kind of integration by part, there is a boundary term. And this exactly will give you the mass in the positive mass theorem. And, and again, this, so you see this formulas Again, enter in Dirac operator, and here they enter in a kind of variation or differential equations, but there is no kind of universal way to speak about that. It's kind of really piecemeal, think linked a little bit, and kind of common, common ground for many things, but there is no, absolutely no, no hint of general mathematics behind it. There might be simple kind of algebra analysis, the entire good theory here, and it's absent. And there might be kind of, and this is a, another kind of, Probably now I formulated all kind of basic uh, geometric theorem which are known there. They have, yeah. 
slightly more inequalities related in, in dimension three, because there is Gauss Bonnet and, 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 and I think related to relativity, but there is altogether maybe five, six, seven theorems. And Penrose, the only one which tells you about stability, and there is no good stability theorems. And then one, one simple thing, but kind of <coughs> also essential, everything for scaly curvature has counterpart for mean curvature. And this is usually strange enough harder to prove. They may be more elementary, just with inclusion space, but they're usually harder to prove. In, the, in all non-trivial cases, the way proved, you reduce it to scaly curvature, you use Dirac operators, which is absurd, yeah, which you don't see directly there. Right? So they, they appear as boundary of some um, a manifold, and then you smooth this boundary, so the Dirac operator method works, da, 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 so it's a little bit strange. So, and so altogether, I want to say the more you prove, the less you understand that this is very good, of course, because much, much to be understood. Okay, so my time is over. And so I have posted something, and I will add more, because I wrote more, and I add to, to, today a little bit more um, to, to these lectures. And so, and if there are questions, I will be happy, happy to, to answer them. So what is the Penrose mass theorem? Hmm? What is positive, positive mass theorem? So uh, the po positive mass theorem, I, I explained the, 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 the exact formulation all beyond myself, but the meaning is as follows. Of course, it's basic positive mass theorem. So there are cells, uh, you can formulate in a very stupid way, but in a very, very efficient way, saying that you, you can, so first I think that, again, what, what is the idea? You have many this and it somehow goes to infinity. And a very naive way, different way to go into infinity, you may go by round cones. It may be cone which is sharper than flat cone or more open. And if it, if it is sharper, it's kind of infinite positive mass. If op open, it's negative infinite, uh, negative, uh, this negative mass at infinity, right? Ma energy infinity. So what, in fact, the picture is, you can see the flat situation and perturbation which is smaller than conical. Is the array decay is smaller. And the model picture is a Schwarzschild metric. Okay, I don't remember what it is, but it's this unique spheric asymmetric metric of this shape which invariant under rotations. And essentially mass corresponds to, the, to this to this gap here. Yeah. Right? And so this is a model example of positive of, of, of positive mass behavior. Then there is the following theorem that if you have this Manifold which, uh, uh, in the first order of magnitude approach in Euclidean, if it has negative mass, so it means it was it it was um, uh, diverging faster than Euclidean. And so so it says the idea is if it has negative mass diverge faster, it's bigger than Euclidean. Therefore, you don't expect positive scalar curvature. But however, if you have it, then you can extend it to a flat one. With, with positive curvature. So if somebody was expanding too fast with positive, you can turn it and still become convex and going slightly slower. Right? If, it, if it convex and, and, and diverges faster than flat, you can turn it by flat and still keeping, still keeping positive. And this is a theorem with a the lock-up. So positive mass if and only if, I mean negative mass if and only if you can make it flat and finish it. Therefore, if you have negative mass, manifold of positive scalar curvature with negative mass, you have a manifold which is flat infinity and somewhere positive. Therefore, you would have metric on the torus with this property, and we know it's impossible. Right. So it is quite, quite easy. And this argument is quite easy. It's just exactly you solve some differential equations. And, and, and here's a Lee term theorem is more powerful of the same type. So very many manipulation. With this, you, relate some, you solve some suitable differential equations. And uh, you can pump a little bit scaly curvature from here to here, and then to say it's impossible, which is a little bit absurd. All arguments are like that. You do many construction, uh, organizing, and then say, ha, after all, you know it's impossible. It's a little bit, a little bit bizarre, but the, some of the results as, as, uh, which come quite, quite, quite amusing and sharp. They're not, they really kind of rather sharp theorem. So that's, that's about positive mass. There is big activity also for, which, I, which is for hyperbolic manifolds. <laughs> So it's again, it was proven by Minou that hyperbolic metric, you can be, be, be deform it in a compact region and make scalar curvature more positive. And moreover, then it was improved by various people 
using, but he uses tricky Dirac operator. So now I must admit I don't quite understand them. You take Dirac operator and add some scalar term. And the moment you define the scalar term, the square of the Dirac operator becomes this, plus something exactly this enters. So, so, so operator on this manifold on the hyperbolic space become non-negative. So that that, that, that squared plus, I think it, it, it becomes some, some, something like plus n, n minus 1, plus scalar curvature over 4. So this cancels this term. But however, you can't use index theorem, if I understand correctly, which I'm, I'm not certain. So what happens, it becomes, it's, it's still elliptic, but it doesn't split. Of course, you, you can't have anti-commutation. Yeah, it, it, it disappears. Right. However, the Witten argument works, it doesn't need it. Right? You still can construct. And then there was variation of which term you add here. And in different people, you add somewhat different terms and have different results and different precision of this result. On the other hand, once you believe, and this is, was known, this Lockham theorem here, whatever positive mass tell, it reduces to that. And this, again, can be pro proven by minimal surfaces by uh, kind, of, kind of compactification, partial compactification. So, but still, I mean, for, for negative curvature, our understanding is much more limited of what happens. There are, again, two methods. There are actually three methods, one coming from Minou and its variation. There are minimal surfaces. And thirdly, what I said, people, and I apologize that I forgot the name of people, when you use spectrum, spectrum of the, the, the Iraq operator twisted with many, many, many sections. So this is uh, what happens in negative. And then people cite quite, quite, quite a few papers that don't exactly understand their significance, what happens for different perturbation of hyperbolic geometry. They have really hold minology and about maybe uh, hundred papers in there. It's unclear to me what they tell. They're all very, sp in a way, special. They concern very special geometry. <coughs> but they still give you sometimes sharp inequalities. It's unknown what happens, say, for complex hyperbolic space. Probably you can deform it locally in larger uh, scale equation, but it's unclear. It's, you cannot do it in careless geometry, it's not. But, but again, it's uh, lots of little kind of directions, but there are is principal issues. And so, so one of them is overall shape, stability, and the most fundamental, what are the correct objects where the theory should be applied to. It's, it's not, uh, there is definitely, well, I, I was saying this before, I'm pretty convinced everything which doesn't involve directly spin must be applicable to polyhedral spaces where singularity have positive sectional curvature, which is called Alexander spaces. So if, because if this very simple singularity, but polyhedral spaces with sharp cones. And already there become Dirac method makes no sense. The pole is already locally wrong. And with minimal surfaces, they should work. But then singularity becomes really kind of rather unpleasant. And if you pretend they're not there, and sometimes you can do it, it's OK. But in general, it's unknown. So the whole geometric measure theory seems to be true in this case. But, but then, this, well, Something is, uh, I'm saying, something is clear what to do, and something is not so clear. Because you, when you start making construction, and then it's unclear if you keep, it keeps you in the right category. Uh, yeah. up, to dimension, yeah. up to dimension seven, maybe you can do it. But again, it's, it's, it has not been done. All, all, you see, it fits very well. If you blow up a tangent cone, whatever, in minimum surface theory, in the Alexander theory, they perfectly go along. But this has not been done. I think it's quite feasible, but it has not been done. But I don't think it's the issue or that's the main kind of, it's kind of definite, uh, precisely formulated class of questions, but not, not the most kind of exciting ones. OK, so uh, I probably stop. Unless you have question again. Yeah. So you talked about uh, some kind of rigidity for federal inequality. Yes. Uh, it is, you know, Penrose inequality is stability. So the, the Penrose uh, inequality is the one relating the Hawking mass and the ADM mass? Yeah, the, the, the simplest form, yeah, this, I must admit I don't know this terminology. I keep forgetting who is who, but what it says is as follows. That if I have space which at infinity looks like the Schwarz metric uh, with, with this kind of sphere. Now, and now it goes anyway with, with positive scalar curvature, but you may have these bubbles, but in, in infinity like that. And if you take this, each bubble from 
the, the first bubble from each side. The sum of areas of these bubbles is smaller than this area. And this is the inequality. This is kind of very, very nice inequality. And where can, can we find this stability statement? It, it, no, it, it says this, if you perturb, if you perturb a, a little bit this metric, this Schwarzschild metric, that all this stuff which appears can be cut away by small stuff. This is how, how you interpret the stability. This is how you interpret the stability, uh, stability statement. <laughs> right, but this, this sharp result un unavailable in any other situation. And the proof is very two-dimensional. So, but uh, <laughs> where, who proved it? The, I think in this final version by Bray, but it was before it proven by, by some other people in, uh, under certain conditions when there's only one bubble, it was proven by somebody else before. It's kind of yeah, uh, yes, exactly, but they approved it for one bubble. I, I haven't followed the proof, yes, I, I, it's it going by minimal surfaces and just, it's, it's very kind of, kind of convincing, right? not, 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 terribly, not, terribly, not terribly difficult. There is a heuristic argument by Penrose, which is probably easy to, to make rigorous which actually these people have done. But I haven't followed in detail. <coughs> Happy? Okay.